Now we're going to learn about the concept of the reaction quotient. And the symbol for the reaction quotient is capital Q. Now the reaction quotient in this case would be the pressure of the ammonia squared over the pressure of the nitrogen times the partial pressure of the hydrogen. So this would be how we write the reaction expression the reaction quotient expression for this particular reaction. So it's either um, products over reactants in terms of pressure or concentration? Yeah, exactly. So what's our general rule here? As we were just saying, notice we put the products on the top and the reactants, the starting materials on the bottom, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive because you might think of starting with the starting materials. But no, we start with the products on the top and the starting materials on the bottom. And there are exponents. Where do the exponents come from? The exponents are the stoichiometric coefficients from the balanced equation. So yet again, we can't solve the problem until we've balanced the equation. So we can see where this 2 came from. It came from here, and this 3 came from here. And what's the exponent on this pressure? Well, it's really 1, which matches this stoichiometric coefficient. Now, when you're dealing with gases, um, the default reaction quotient is in terms of the partial pressures. So these are the partial pressures of each gas. However, you can also define a reaction quotient that's in terms of the concentrations, Q sub C. Do you remember what the symbol is for the concentration of something? A bracket. Yeah, brackets. So let's write this in terms of concentrations. I'll follow the same basic principles, but we're going to put in concentrations instead of partial pressures. Looks good. is to use pressure. So if you're going to use concentrations, you have to call that the Q sub C. Um, and you guys know what these little, um, these things in parentheses are? These are the phases of the species. What are the phases that you might see? Solid, aqueous, gas, liquid. These are the phases that you're likely to see on the test. Solid, aqueous, gas, and liquid. Solid means solid, gas means vapor, liquid means liquid. What does, what does aqueous mean? Um, in solution. <clears throat> and, and what would be the solvent? Yeah. So aqueous means dissolved in water. Aqueous means dissolved in water. On the test, uh, you're unlikely to use any solvents besides water. So this would probably be the only type of solution you would use. So, there's a so aqueous and liquid are not the same things. Aqueous means dissolved in water. Does liquid ever apply it? I mean, is it applying to things other than water? Sure. You could have uh, liquid bromine, for example. Right. That's right. But so, does it, does it uh, imply that it's pure? It implies that it's pure, or sometimes we, we can, um, there's usually way more of the solvent than of the solute. Okay. So you would write the solvent as L, okay. even though it's really mixed up. With the, uh, with the solute as well. So the solute would be written as aqueous if it's dissolved in water, but the water would be written with an L for liquid. So when we're dealing with gaseous phase, there's two possible reaction quotients. This is the default, so it doesn't need a subscript. And here's an alternative in terms of concentrations, where you would use C. How about if you're dealing with aqueous species? Well, for aqueous species, it wouldn't be typical to work with pressures, right? So for aqueous species, the default is to use concentrations. And then you don't even need to put in the little c, because it's understood that it's concentrations, because that's the only thing you would ever see. So for aqueous, you would use concentrations, and you don't need to specify that little c, because that's the only reaction quotient there is. But gases are more complicated. For gases, there's a default reaction quotient in terms of pressures, and an alternative in terms of concentrations that you have to specify with little c for concentrations. How about for pure solids, 
Well, reaction quotient does not include pure solids or pure liquids, or you could say they're included as the number one, if you like. So that turns out to be quite important. The only species that are included in the reaction quotients are aqueous phase and gaseous phase. We're never going to include solid phase or liquid phase. That's one reason why it's useful to actually specify the phase, as I've been doing all along, usually when we've been writing the chemical equations. We haven't been using that yet, but that becomes important when you're using reaction quotients and equilibrium constants, because some things get put into the expression and some things get left out. So only aqueous and gaseous phase get included in Q. Um, and solid and liquid get left out. Now, what does this tell us intuitively? Well, let's say that, um, first of all, let's say that we're at the, uh, let's say that we start with zero product. What would the reaction quotient be? If we started with uh, zero product? Yeah, and some. and some starting materials, what will be the numerical value of the reaction quotient? Um, Q uh, equals zero. Yeah, that's right. Because we're plugging in zero for this pressure. And of course, the concentration would be zero as well. So the point is, at the very beginning of a reaction, if you haven't made any products yet, Q is zero. Another way of putting it is, if the reaction is totally in the reverse position, so to speak, then Q is zero. That's kind of like the starting position in a sense. We haven't moved forward at all. Now, as the reaction moves forward, what will happen to the concentration of the products? Yeah, that's what it means to move forward. And what's going to happen to the concentration of the starting materials? Go down? Yeah. Now, if the concentration of the products goes up, what effect would that have on Q? Would that increase or decrease Q? Increase. And if the concentration of the starting materials goes down, what effect would that have on Q? Increase Q? Also increase. That's a little bit more complicated, but if the starting materials are going down, that gives us a smaller denominator. But a smaller denominator gives us a bigger fraction. So conveniently, both of these have the same effect on Q. Both the change in the products and the change in the starting materials would tend to increase Q. So what that tells us is, as the reaction goes forward, Q increases. So now we have an intuitive interpretation of Q Q tells us how far forward the reaction has gone. Remember, if we haven't gone forward at all, Q would be zero. So the further we are from zero, the further forward the reaction has gone. Q can never be negative. Technically, Q can go to infinity. As the amount of starting materials goes closer and closer to zero, this will go closer and closer to infinity. Um, in reality, you never completely use up every scrap of starting materials. You never get to infinity, but you can get very, very big Qs. So for practical purposes, if Q is very huge, then the reaction has gone to completion. So again, our intuitive understanding of Q is Q is a measure of how far forward the reaction has gone. If, if Q is getting bigger, the reaction is moving forward. And if Q is uh, getting smaller, the reaction is going backwards. Isn't there some kind of like arbitrary assignment to Q, like how high it is determined? You know, like if it's above a certain level, then that means the reaction has gone forward, but there's not necessarily like a particular uh, let's see. I may or may not understand the point that you're making. So um, I think that there is a, like a reference value that we're going to compare Q to that we'll get to in a couple minutes. So maybe maybe when we get to that, that will uh, that what you're talking about will we'll apply to that. So we'll see. Okay. So um, Notice, though, that if you change the amount of a liquid or a solid, that wouldn't affect Q. <clears throat> so as the reaction is going forward, Q is increasing. And as the reaction is going backwards, Q is decreasing. So what can you tell me about uh, Q in this case? Q increases. Q 
must be increasing because we're moving forward. And what's happening in this case? Q is decreasing. Q is decreasing. And how about in this case? So what does that tell us more concretely about Q? In this case, Q would be increasing. In this case, Q would be decreasing. So what's happening to Q here? It doesn't change. Yeah, it's constant. That's right. That's our third uh, possibility. In equilibrium, so in equilibrium, we're not moving forward or reverse, right? So if Q is a measure of how far forward we've gone, well, when we're moving forward, Q should be increasing. And when we're moving backward, Q should be decreasing. And when we're not moving, Q should be constant. Now remember, of course, when, when we're in equilibrium, what we say is the net reaction isn't going forward. The forward reaction is still happening, but it's canceled by the reverse. So maybe we should say that Q is a measure of how far forward the net reaction has gone, balancing both the forward and the reverse.